Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I again have the privilege to speak the Word of God to you guys today. And, um, and this morning, our focus is going to be on um, a very small book called Habakkuk. <clears throat> Excuse me. The book of Habakkuk will be our focus today, chapters 1, 2, and 3. And if you guys never um, read or heard of this book, Habakkuk is in the Old Testament before Nahum, or after Nahum, and before Zephaniah. I'll, I'll give you guys a minute or two to get there. <clears throat> to give you a little background of Habakkuk, um, Habakkuk was a prophet during um, this time, during his time, but that's all the Bible gives us. Um, in chapter 1, we, only, we get his name, the oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw. So Habakkuk was a prophet during his time, and we don't know much more about him, but what we do know is that during, um, but what we do know is that uh, he was living in a society where wickedness and injustice was all around him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this morning we will see some of the questions that Habakkuk asks God. And from these questions and answers, we will learn. We will learn from them. We will understand what these questions and answers mean. And from these questions, we can also relate ourselves to what Habakkuk was going through because we too also live in a sinful wicked society where we too as believers see wickedness and hatred of God all around us. We will learn from Habakkuk how we are supposed to respond, how we are supposed to respond to these, to these wickedness, sinful things around us that are happening in our society. And we will see that society expects us to respond in one way, but the Bible tells us to respond in a different way. Habakkuk saw the wicked lives prospering, but the question he has was, why is their life prospering when they are wicked? And from Habakkuk today, we will see how he responded to the prosperity of the wicked and how we, as believers, are to respond to the prosperity of the wicked. And today we will learn and see there are three ways to respond to the prosperity of the wicked. And let me give you the three responses before we begin. The first way to respond is to trust God in whatever circumstances. The second way to respond is to accept any circumstances given to us by God. And the third way to respond is to be joyful in whatever circumstances we are in. So the first way is to respond. The first way to respond is to trust God in whatever circumstance. Second way to respond is to accept any circumstance God gives us. And the third way to respond is to be joyful in whatever circumstances we are in. So let's take a look at our first point. The first way to respond to the prosperity of the wicked and that is to trust God in whatever circumstances. Habakkuk asks God, what am I supposed to do in the situation where all around me I see the wicked prospering? And we see this, in, uh, we see this question being asked in verses 1 through 4. Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw how long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I, cr I cry out to you, violence, yet you do not save. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored, and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Throughout this, whole <clears throat> excuse me. Throughout this whole situation, 
Habakkuk is out there wondering what is going on. He's looking around him and asking himself, what is going on? Why is God allowing or tolerating so much injustice and wickedness among his very own people in the nation of Judah? In verse 3, Habakkuk asks again, Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. And to, to sum up this um, verse 3, to sum up this verse, he's basically asking, why do you tolerate the wrong? And this is a fair question. This is a fair question that Habakkuk asks. Asks. He sees wickedness around him and through prayer he petitions to God. He sees the unjust, the wicked, but also sees that God isn't doing anything about it. So Habakkuk goes to prayer and asks God, why, why is this happening? And God answers Habakkuk by telling him, what you see is correct. What you see is wickedness and unjust around you, but your conclusion is not correct. What we see here through Habakkuk is true wickedness and injustice, but when he asks God why he is not judging them for it, that is where he was wrong. God tells Habakkuk, I do not tolerate wrong, and I will judge them. I will execute justice against the wrong doing in the nation of Judah. But not just execute, but not just execute them, but God will use the ruthless Chaldeans. God will use them to judge the nation. And this, when Habakkuk heard, was the shocking news to him. Habakkuk knew who the Chaldeans were. He knew that they were the world's greatest power country of that time. But Habakkuk also knew that they had no moral virtue or justice. They were actually the opposite of moral and justice. And these Chaldeans were not the people you would look up to to learn what moral virtue or justice was. And this answer from God brought hardship and pain in Habakkuk's heart. And from all this, I believe that Habakkuk is the model that we are to follow. He is a good model for us to follow in this wicked society. The first thing he does is gets on his knees and seeks the Lord. He doesn't complain. He doesn't go out to his friends and complain about how bad this world is or how wicked this world is. But he seeks the Lord's wisdom by praying first. And as we read already, we see this in verse, verses 2 and 4. He cries out for help. He cries out to the Lord. How much longer when there is violence, when there's iniquity, when there's wickedness before us? And this may at first sound like a complaint, right? If, you, if this is your first time reading this, you're reading this and saying like, why is he complaining about, um, about the people in Judah? But I believe this is an honest prayer to God. This is Habakkuk getting on his knees and praying with a sincere and honest heart. As Habakkuk is looking around him, what he sees is violence, wickedness, destruction, strife, and the law being ignored, and injustice. And he is petitioning to God, how much longer do I need to deal with this wickedness and injustice? How much longer do I need to see this among your people? And through this prayer, we can come up with some facts about what Habakkuk knew about God. Habakkuk not only knew that God could do something about the injustice in Judah, but he also knew that it was occurring because God was allowing it to happen. Why else would he pray to God and ask him, when are you going to judge these wicked people? Right? If he didn't believe that, why else would he pray? He did believe that God was in control, and that is why he got on his knees and prayed. But not only that, Habakkuk also knew that this was inconsistent with God's character. 
He knew that God couldn't stand wickedness. He knew that God couldn't stand injustice because God is a God of good, right, and just. This prayer is a prayer of a believer who is in anguish because of the wickedness around him and and knows that he can approach this good and sovereign God with an honest prayer. Let me ask you this. How many of us here today pray for the sin of, the, of this nation? When we see sin, are we too in anguish? Are we too asking the Lord, why is this happening? Why are you allowing this to happen, to bring down your name when you are the God of all, sovereign over all things in this world? And through Habakkuk's prayer, we learn that we need to trust in God in everything. No matter what is, no matter what is going around, around us, we need to trust that God is in control. And as believers, we need to get on our knees every day and pray for the wicked. Pray for the injustice of this world. We need to trust God that He is in control and that He will take care of of the sins that put his son on the cross. And that is exactly what God does. And that is exactly what God does. God answers Habakkuk's prayer by saying that he does not tolerate wicked and unjust. And that day, the uh, people in the nation of Judah, they too will be judged. And we see this in our second point. The second way to respond is to accept any circumstances God gives us. Verses 5 through 11. Verse 5. Chapter 1, verse 5. Look among the nations. Observe. Be astonished. Wonder. Because I am doing something in your days you would not believe if you were told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth, to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping down to devour. All of them come for violence. Their horde of faces move, moves forward. They collect captives like sand. They mock at kings and rulers, are laughing matter to them. They laugh at their fortress and heap up rubble to capture it. Then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be held guilty. They whose strength is their God. From From here, verses 5 through 11, we get this very detailed imagery of what and how God is going to judge the nation of Judah. God tells Habakkuk, I will judge the the wickedness in Judah. You are correct to say that I cannot tolerate the wicked and unjust, so I will judge them. I will judge them how? I will judge them by using the Chaldeans. And I said this um, before but about the Chaldeans, but everyone knew what type of people the Chaldeans were. And they were probably the worst of the worst. More wicked than the people in Judah. And in verse 7, we see this. Verse seven, chapter 1, verse 7, they are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. So they didn't know what was right or wrong. They didn't know justice. Their justice was themselves. And this news brings a shock to Habakkuk. Even God says this will bring a uh, shock to Habakkuk, because in verse 5, God says, you would not believe if you were told. Habakkuk is in shock, and he just can't believe what he has just heard. And he can't fathom why God would use such people like the Chaldeans to judge God's own people. And when they're and, when, and where the Chaldeans are even worse than the nation of Judah. 
And here, and, and in verses 12 through, 12 through chapter 2, verse 1, we see Habakkuk responding to God's um, answer. Verse 12, Are you not from everlasting? O Lord, my God, my Holy One, we will not die. You, O Lord, have appointed them to judge, and you, O Rock, have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? Why have you made, them, made men like the fish of the sea, like creeping things without a ruler over them? The Chaldeans bring all of them up with a hook, drag them away with their net, and gather them together in their fishing net. Therefore they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they offer a sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their fishing net, because through these things they, their catch is large and their food is plentiful. Verse 17, will they therefore empty their net and continually slay nations without sparing? Chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand on my guard post and station myself to the rampart, and I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. Here, Habakkuk is basically asking God, why the Chaldeans? Why? Why them? Verse 13, your eyes are too pure to approve evil, and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Then why do you look with favor on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? Habakkuk doesn't understand the situation. Why is God allowing a wicked nation to swallow those more righteous than they? And I think I kind of find this funny because Habakkuk, his, verse, his very first prayer was to do what? Was to ask God, why is he not judging the nation of Judah? Because of their wickedness. But then when God says, I will judge them, but I will use the Chaldeans to judge them, Habakkuk is taken back. He's asking, what is going on? Why, Lord? Why? Why, God? Like, how can you use someone like the Chaldeans who are worse than us to judge us? And the question we need to ask here is this. Why would God, who is holy and good, use the wicked and evil Chaldeans when God cannot look at evil and tolerate them? And, I, and the answer is simple. The answer is simple. It's it's in the scripture. God's final answer is, I know what the Chaldeans are like. And after I have used them, I will judge them also. After I have used the Chaldeans to judge my people, I will use the, I'll judge the Chaldeans myself. And from this, we need to understand that God will and can use anything or anyone to fulfill his will. And how are we to respond? All we can do is accept what is going on, accept the circumstances that we are put in, and trust in God. Brothers, sisters, have faith in God and live out that faith in your life. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4 says this. God says this. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. Meaning that, as we, as, meaning that we as believers need to trust in God and accept whatever or any circumstances that we are put in. Whether it's God using the wicked to judge his people or God allowing the wicked to prosper, we as believers need to live by faith. And we see this from Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul uses this verse throughout the whole New Testament, but um, we see this especially in Romans. In the book of Romans. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. 
Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And this verse may be familiar to, to a lot of us, but this is where Paul gets, gets the righteous man shall live by faith, from Habakkuk 2, chapter 4. So Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. So this means whatever happens, whatever is going on, we trust in the Lord that we live by faith. If you are a believer, you are made righteous with God. And because of that, you are to live by faith. It doesn't matter if you don't agree with God, just like Habakkuk didn't agree with God. Habakkuk's, Habakkuk disagreed with God's plan for using the Chaldeans to judge the nation of Judah, but in the end, what happened? In the end, Habakkuk knew that he needed to live by faith and trust in God. Habakkuk knew that he needed to accept whatever circumstances that he was put in because he knew and trusted that God was in control over all things. And God could have just left him there, right? God could have just answered him and just left him there to, to trust in him and to, and to um, yeah, sorry, and to trust in him. But God, knowing that God is a good God, comforts Habakkuk after this shocking news. He comforts him. He tells him after he has finished using the Chaldeans, he will judge the Chaldeans too. He's going to judge the drunk, the arrogant, restless, greedy, and dissatisfied Chaldeans by giving them over to the sin. And we see this in chapter, um, chapter 2 throughout chapter 2. And I'm going to pick out some verses to just show you how God will judge the Chaldeans. And we, the first one we see is in chapter 2, verse 8. Because you have looted many nations, all the remainder of the people will loot you. Meaning that God will use other nations to judge, judge Chaldeans and take back what they have taken. Because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town and all its inhabitants. Chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. Surely the stone will cry out from the wall and, and the rafter will answer it from the framework. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with violence. Is it not indeed from the Lord of hosts that people toil for fire and the nation grow weary for nothing? Chapter 2, verse 17 through 19. For the violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, Chaldeans, and the devastation of its beasts by which you terrified them because of human bloodshed and violence done to the land, to the town of all its inhabitants. What profit is the idol when, it, when its maker has carved it or an image, a teacher of falsehood? For its maker trusts in his own handiwork when he fashions speechless idols. Woe to him who says to the piece of wood, Awake to a mute stone, arise, and that is your teacher. Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all inside it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. All this, all this, so that in the end, God will be glorified through these actions. Right? Chapter 2, verse 14 again, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I mean, what an encouragement to us believers today. What an encouragement. Amen? What an encouragement as, as we live in this wicked world. You know, some of us may be going through difficult situations situations that we don't understand and we ask God why are we going through this situation 
But, th- um, but God shows us through Habakkuk that through all these troubles, what lies ahead is even greater. That we can look, that we can hope to the future knowing that God will take care of his own people. That God will take care of us in the end. His people, us believers, will end up glorifying him through the goodness of what we have all received. And as I read already, God concludes with with, um, this in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 20. But the Lord is in his temple, in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Now what does this mean? These Chaldeans worshipped their idols, spoke to them, Right As we see in uh, verse 19, Woe to him who says to the piece of wood, Awake! Can't tell the wood to awake. To the mute stone, arise! And that is your teacher? God is saying these idols that the, these Chaldeans worship are nothing. That these idols are nothing. God is saying, I am who I am. And the glory of God is his own and God is real. He's saying when judgment comes, I will dwell in my holy temple and the whole earth, the whole earth will be silent before me. When we as believers are in the presence of God, when we are studying his word, we are silent. We are silent and we listen. When God speaks, we listen. We don't try to talk over him or ignore God's word, but through the word, through the scripture, through the word of God, when God is speaking, we will be silent and listen to what God has says to God has says to listen to what God has to say to us. Now, if you're an unbeliever here today, if you do not believe in God, the question you need to ask yourself is this. What are you doing with your life? If you haven't given your life to Christ yet, the question I'm asking you today is, what are you doing with your life? You may be living the life, like the best life that the world can give you, just like the Chaldeans. You may be living a life that you are happy with, that you're content with. But as we learn from the book of Habakkuk, from Habakkuk, God sovereignly uses everyone, even the unrighteous, to carry out his will. And if you're not a child of God, as a righteous man living by faith before the Lord, it doesn't matter how you are living in this world. It doesn't matter if you're enjoying it and living in your riches, you too will be judged. No one knows when that is going to happen, just like how Habakkuk didn't know when the Chaldeans were going to be judged. But, but listen, the judgment will happen. The Lord will come back, and you will be judged. You will suffer the wrath of God if you do not believe, if you are not a child of God. And listen, you don't want to be the ones opposing Christ when this happens. You don't want to be the ones opposing Christ and his church when the time comes, but you want to be part of the body of Christ and be among his people when Christ comes again. And for believers, if you are a believer here today, we must understand That God can use, that God can, sorry, if you are a believer today, we must understand that God can use surprising events to accomplish his goals in mind. Just how, just like how he used the Chaldeans to accomplish his judgment in Judah. You know, as believers, God never promises that everything will be perfect or good in life. God never promised that everything will happen according to what you think should happen. But God promised us eternal life 
as believers, and our job as Christians is to live a righteous life by faith. Even the prophet Habakkuk was in shock, right? He was in shock, and that's why he had to um, pray a second prayer, because this was not Habakkuk's plans, plans to be judged by the Chaldeans. God's plan, if it's God's plan, when, when things do occur that is unexpected from God, then we must accept it. We must trust that God is in control and live by faith that God is going to carry out his will whether we like it or not. God, in the end, will take care of his people. And we must thank him and trust him and praise him for that. Amen? So again, when, when God speaks, we must stay silent. When God carries out his will, we must stay silent and accept to trust in the Lord who is so sovereign over all nations. And if that is... And if that is you today, if you are a believer today, then whatever situation you're in, accept it. And then naturally, once you accept it, you will respond in a joyful manner. And this leads us to our last and third point. The third way to respond is to be joyful in whatever circumstances we are in. We are to respond in a joyful manner. So after, after the questions and answers that we read from chapters 1 and 2, now we turn to our attention to our chapter 3 of Habakkuk. Chapter 1 was all about Habakkuk asking God, why are you not judging the people of the wicked in the nation of Judah? And God answers them, I will judge the people because of their wickedness and injustice, but I will use the Chaldeans. And chapter 2 is, is Habakkuk responding to that, asking God, why use the Chaldeans who are more unjust and who are more wicked than the people in Judah? And God answering and comforting Habakkuk, don't worry, I, I too will judge, not only judge J Judah, but I will also judge the people of Chaldeans. And, after, and Habakkuk, after hearing all this, this comfort, we see how he responds in chapter 3. And in this chapter, in, the, in, in, the, in Habakkuk chapter 3, we will learn that the only answer to anything in this world is God. God is the ultimate answer to everything. And we see Habakkuk praying for mercy and joy in this last chapter. And, and we can break this chapter up into three parts. Verses 1 and 2, we see Habakkuk's prayer to God for mercy. Verses 3 through 15, it's his prayer on the vision of God. And verses 6, 16 through 18, prayer proclaiming the wonderful goodness and joy in God. So after all these questions and answers going back and forth with God, hearing directly from God on what God is going to do, all Habakkuk can think to do is get on his knees and praise God. So let's take a look, let's, so let's take a look um, briefly, briefly in chapter 3, um, what, what and how Habakkuk prays to God. Verses 1 and 2. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigoenath, Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk recognizes that we are all wicked, and he understands, he understands that. And he understands that God does care for justice and good. That God will take care of any wickedness 
in this world and injustice. So the first thing that comes out of Habakkuk's mouth is what? In his prayer. Is have mercy. In wrath, remember what? Remember mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord, because we are wicked sinners too. As believers, the first thing we need to do in our prayer is ask for mercy. We are wicked people who don't deserve salvation. Yet what happened? Yet God, yet God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for us so that for those who believe we'll be saved. And as believers, every day, every moment of our lives, because of our sins, we need to get onto, we need to get onto our knees and, and pray and ask for, for forgiveness and mercy. Because without that, we all deserve to go to hell. Praise God for his mercy and grace. Praise God for his forgiveness. And we should have joy as believers in that. And if you are not a believer and if you don't believe in this, then please repent of your sins. Ask God for grace and mercy so that you would not have to face his, his just and his wrath. And secondly, verses 3 through 15 here we see Habakkuk describes God's coming, his judgment, and when he does come, we see that all of creation will react in humble submission. Verse 3, chapter 3, verse 3. God comes from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covers the heavens and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hand. And there is the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the earth. He looked and startled, startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. Verse 7, I saw the tents of Cushion under distress. The tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Did the Lord rage against the rivers, or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses, on your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made bare. The rods of chastisement were sworn. You cleaved the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands. Sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation, you marched through, through the earth. In anger, you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You struck the head of the house of the evil to lay open from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own spears the head of his throngs. They stormed in, in to scatter us. Their exaltation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trampled on, on the sea with your horses, on the surge of many waters. Again, here Habakkuk describes God's coming. And it, it, it is pretty scary how when God does come, he will judge the nation. And when he does come, we will all be silent. If you haven't repented already, or, or, if you haven't repented already, quickly repent of your sins before the Lord comes, or you will be judged. And, and the Bible never says when God will come when Jesus will come. But when he does come, there will be big judgment. And because you have not turned away from your sins, justice will be served, and you will pay for your sins. 
if you are an unbeliever. But if you are a believer, have joy knowing that one day God will come and when he does come, we will be praising with him, praising him and glorifying him all for all eternity. And lastly, verses 6 through 19. Chapter 3, verse 16 through 19. I, I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble, because I must wait quietly for the days of distress, for the people to arise who will invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hind's feet and makes me walk on my high places. Praise the Lord. What a testimony from Habakkuk. Habakkuk concludes in response to God's coming by confessing that his joy is in God alone. Look at the situation that he puts himself in. Right? Though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, what does he do? Verse 18, Yet, I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in God, my salvation. Basically, he's saying, even though I have nothing, even though I have no food, cattle, or whatever situation I'm in, I will rejoice in the Lord because He is my strength, because He is my salvation. And we too, as believers, are to respond in this joyful manner. Why? Because we know that one day God will come, to come and judge the wicked while his children will be in the presence of their mighty Father who loves them and takes care of them. Again, this comes back to judgment. If you are an unbeliever here today, if you don't believe in God, ask your question this. Ask yourself this question. Can I find joy in any circumstance? And I guarantee you the answer is no. You can't find any joy in this world other than Christ. You need to repent and ask for forgiveness, giving your life to Him, or else you will countlessly seek joy in this world, and in the end, you will not find that joy or satisfaction. You can only find joy by trusting in God, and nothing else. Why? Because we were made to know God. We were made to know God, and that's why we are alive today. Without God and living a righteous life before Him, you are living a life of sin. And God has every right to condemn you of your sins. But what's the good news? The good news is this, that instead of condemning you, he, he came in Jesus Christ, lived a perfect life, and died on the cross as a substitute on our behalf, bearing God's just wrath for the sins of all those who would ever turn from their sins and trust in him. And for believers, have joy in whatever situation you are in. Why are we to have joy? Because this world that we are living in, living in is only temporal. Our citizenship is not on this earth, but it is in heaven, and we are to have that perspective. If that is our perspective, no matter what situation we are in, no, ma no matter what horrible or bad events are given to us, we will know that we are only here temporarily and that we can have joy that one day this world will pass by and we will be in heaven in the presence of, of our good God. And I, I believe that is why in verse 17 Habakkuk is saying no matter what 
you give or no matter what we don't have, I will exalt in you, Lord, because you are my God, my salvation, and my strength. Turn with me to Philippians 3, chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 to 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21. Who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. Amazing. Amazing how we as believers can hope and have that hope that in the future God will come and that we will be in his presence praising him and glorifying him. But on the contrary, as as unbelievers, you have no hope in that. You have no hope in anything or in the future because you will be judged. So Habakkuk, through the honest questioning, learned that what he most wanted was his God. God of honest, God of just, God of faithfulness, and God of love. And brothers and sisters and friends, that is all we need today. All we need is God. With God, our satisfaction and joy is complete in our lives. And what more can we ask for? But if God is not with you today, then you will spend countless of hours trying to find this joy and satisfaction in something that, will, that you will never be able to find. And one day, when the Lord does come, be judged and have your life wasted because of that. So I urge you, friends, those who don't believe today, acknowledge your sins to God. Repent from them. Turn away from your own life and start living your life for God. For God sent his only begotten son to die on the cross for those who believe. So believe today. Give your life to God and let him be the master of your life. So so to conclude from Habakkuk, we learn three ways to respond to the prosperity of the wicked. The first way to respond as believers is to trust God in whatever circumstance. The second way to respond is to accept any circumstance God gives us. And the third way to respond is to be joyful in whatever circumstance we are in. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, I pray and ask that you will have mercy on all of us here today. We were sinners who did not deserve anything. We were sinners who deserved your just, your wrath. Yet because of your Son, we are able to believe and put our trust in you. Lord, as we learn from Habakkuk, protect us from this wicked nation. May we continue to put our trust in you, accept any outcomes that are given to us by you, and in the end respond in the joyful manner, knowing that you are in control. Thank you for your grace and for your mercy. Thank you for your son dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for unhearting all our hearts so that we we are able to believe and turn away from our sins. Lord, I pray that your name will be glorified, that your name will be shown throughout this whole nation, and that when the day comes, Lord, that we would all praise you and glorify you, Lord, because, Lord, you are our master and our king and our savior. Thank you for our, uh, our brother Habakkuk. Thank you for teaching us this lesson, and may we continue to apply what we have learned today into our everyday lives. In your name, pray.